Hello, welcome back to SAS from Scratch. Today's episode is 14A, and it's 14A because chapter 14 in the prep guide is quite large, contains a lot of information, and so I'm splitting chapter 14 into parts A, B, and C. 14A being all the date functions, 14B being all the string and character functions, 14C will be a bit of a shorter episode, covers a couple of numeric functions. And so the point of learning about all of these functions is because for the most part, when you're programming in SAS, you're going to be using the built-in functions. In R, it's quite easy to find a package that does something, install that package, use it, and confirm whether you are happy with the output or not. In SAS, things work a little differently. So somebody would have to go and manually write a function for you. Uh, that's done with the proc fcmp command. Uh, it's a bit more involved than just writing a function in something like R or any other uh, programming language that you might be used to, like C Sharp or Java or something like that. The other way that people solve problems in SAS is with uh, macros, but it's important to note that macros are not functions. The macro language in SAS is a, pre, a text pre-processing language, uh, and we can look at macros at a, at a later stage. They're not um, applicable to the SAS base exam. But it's basically a fancy way of copying and pasting code is the SAS macro language. That's what it does. Um, and it does annoy me sometimes if people talk about macro functions because there's a difference between a function and a SAS macro. But that's the way you'll see problems being solved in the industry if you're working with SAS. Because... For the most part, you cannot just go and get extra code or packages from somewhere to solve a problem. You're almost limited by a particular toolbox, and it's a good toolbox, but you have that one toolbox with which to solve all your problems. And that means that sometimes you need to be a little bit more elaborate, you might need a bit more code than you would have needed to do something in R, because you're doing things with a foundational set of functions. So let's let's get started. Let's look at all the date functions and hopefully hopefully things will start making sense from from you know just going through all of the all of the content. So there's about four of these slides that just run through some date and time functions. Um, so it's a bit of a misnomer to just say date functions because there's also time functions. The first function we're going to look at is the MDY function. To my knowledge, there is no such thing as a DMY or YMD function. If you're using this function to generate a date, then you have to do it in the format month, day, year. Now, please note that that still just gives you a numeric value back since the 1st of January 1960, which is the SAS date epic. If uh, you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and watch episode 13. That's where we covered it. Um, so the input format you provide is an MDY format, but SAS gives you a numeric number back that you can format in any way that you like. So if you uh, pass MDY 1231 2019, it's going to give you the number of days between 1st of January 1960 and 31 December 2019. And so when we say it's a SAS date, what it really is is just a number, the number of days since that epoch. We can use the today or date function with the empty parentheses to get today's date as a SAS date. So that's linked to your system date. Um, I believe that's wherever the that's wherever the SAS 
installation is sitting. So if, for example, you are in the UK and you're connecting to a SAS server, which is in the US, and that server is set up with US time, if you call uh, today or the time function to get either the date or the time, that's going to return to you the US uh, date and time. So if you start very early in the morning, you might get a date that's still, you know, a couple of, couple of minutes before midnight in the US, and that will kind of throw it off. The, the point is just that that's going to give you some local date and time based on where the SAS installation is. And this is useful if we want to know when things are going to happen from today. So when, when a certain event is going to happen next time from today, how many, how many days will it be until your next birthday, for example? Um, it's also useful if we want to write out logs or we're doing other outputs that require a date and time attached to it. So the, the, the functions that you can use are either today and date to get just the date. You can use time to get just the clock time. I believe there's also a function called date time, open, close parentheses, which will give you both the date and the time. So that's it for just getting the system date and time. What we're going to look at now is a couple of functions to extract certain values from a SAS date. And the first of that is this quarter function, which gives you the quarter of the year from a particular SAS date. So when we say we've got a SAS date, we've got just a number representing the number of days since the 1st of January 1960. And if you pass that number into the quarter function, it gives you, is it quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, or quarter four, without looking at anything else, or without giving you any other information. So it's not going to say, oh, it's quarter one of the year 2019. It's just going to say, this was the first quarter of whatever year it could be, or, you know. So that, that just gives you a value from one, two, three, and four. Uh, maybe we should, maybe we should put that in a bit of code so that these things start making a bit more sense. So let's say, let's do a couple of imaginary dates. Let's do, So I'm just going to use a, a date lit, uh, literal. And so I've got two different dates here. The idea being that. Okay, so if I run this, I'm going to have two columns. I'm going to have date one and date two. Um, and again, as I've said, these are just the numbers since uh, the 1st of January 1960, the number of days since then. So if I run, if I say, okay, well, quarter one equals quarter of date one, and quarter two equals quarter of date two, I'm going to get, I expect for this one, it'll be the first quarter, second quarter runs April, May, June. So this will be the third quarter. I'm not going to save it now. Okay. So we know quarter one is the first quarter for date one and quarter two for date two is the third quarter. I should have named them better because this is not very confusing. The quarter for date one is quarter one. The quarter for day two is quarter three. And that's all it gives you. So 
you can plug in any random number you want, pass it to the quarter function, and that'll give you what quarter is it for a particular number of days since the 1st of January 1960. Likewise, we can do the same for all of these extraction functions. Day, month, year, very easy, and we can do weekday as well. Um, so let's look at a quick, a quick example of that. So if we, I'm just going to take these two guys out. Uh, if we say day one is day of date one, if we say month one is month of date one, and year one is year of date one. Um, and then let's do weekday as well. If we run all of these functions, we've got our date, which is the 15th of January 2023, represented here in numeric format. That's the first quarter. It's the 15th day of the first month of the year 2023. And weekday is 1. And weekday will be anything between 1 and 7, where 1 is on a Sunday. And so you know that the 15th of January 2023 was on a Sunday. And this is just a way of extracting all of these different types of information from a particular SAS date. If you have a date time, let's go and do that. It's the best way of, um, of learning is by doing. So for a character literal for date time, we have to make this suffix dt. I'm going to call this dt1 because it's date time one, and I'm going to add a particular time to this. Let's make it 15 January of this year, roughly lunchtime. That gives me the number of seconds since midnight on the 1st of January 1960 until this particular date that I've given SAS. Now, if I wanted to extract the date from this and only the date, I could simply say date one is the date part of DT one. And similarly for the time, I can say time one is the time part of DT one. And I've got these here. Now this doesn't tell me all that much. So let's put it in a format that is human readable. And if you don't, if you're not too familiar with formats, there's a previous episode on it, you can go and watch that. So let's start by saying, okay, date one is the ISO date format, time one is the ISO time format, and Daytime one is the ISO daytime format. That would have been an error that I would have been busy for five minutes trying to find. Okay, so here's our date time. It's 2023, January 15th at 1 p.m. There's our date. There's our time formatted as a nice clock time, calendar date and a proper date time that we can read. But behind the scenes, these were all numbers and we extracted the different information from a particular number using the SAS functions to do so. DHMS is pretty straightforward. It works similar to the MDY function in the sense that you give it a SAS date Again, that's just a number. And then you can specify a number of hours, minutes, and seconds. So what I can do is say, and there's multiple ways of doing this. So I can either do something like this, where I can say, okay, give me the 15th of January, 2023. And if you're not used to the American format, this takes a little bit of time of, uh, to, to get used to. 
I could obviously have just written it as uh, what we had before, which is this. So either way will work. This gives you the same value back. Let's use our MDY function for a change just so that we um, see it in action. And then if I wanted that same value of lunchtime on the 15th of January 2023, um, I would simply do date one, which is the SAS date that it expects, that number of days since 1 January 1960. I would say the hours are 1300 hours and no seconds. That's a bit redundant. You can simply do this. Um, and this gives me the same. So we can format it. Let's just run this. We get the, our numbers again and we can um, format this to the ISO formats. And we'll see that we have the, the exact same values. So that's MDY and DHMS in action as well gives you the same thing that we had earlier, but this does it with a particular uh, SAS function in mind. So maybe you've got a data set which has day and month and year split into different columns. You can use your MDY function because you can do something like uh, my day and sorry, again, American formats, uh, my month, my day, my year. And so these would point to columns that are in your source data set, for example. And likewise with uh, our minutes and seconds as well. If you've got those in different columns or if you're extracting them from something, um, you can plug them back into these functions to get uh, SAS date or date time value. The one thing to try and keep in mind is if you can avoid extracting things from a particular string and you can simply input it with an in format try to do so and if input and in format doesn't make sense to you go and watch the episode on um, formats it's covered over there because that allows you to avoid a lot of string functions sas might be able to just interpret whatever date format or time format you have already without too much um, too much work on your part Okay, I think so far all of these functions have been pretty straightforward. Um, these are the more interesting functions. So we have intic, int, nx, dat diff, and year diff. And these are the ones that will take a little bit of time just to wrap your head around. And we're going to do an exercise as well where we're going to use some of these. So these functions, the intic function gives you the interval in between two different uh, SAS dates, provided that you that you specify what interval you're looking for. That's a clumsy way of saying it. Um, so for example, if you give it the 10th of January and the 15th of January, and you say, okay, give me the number of days in between, it'll return five days in between. But the intic function, we, I have a slide on it later, it's a little bit finicky in the sense that it looks for whole intervals. So if we look at the weak function or the weak interval, for example, we know that SAS starts on a Sunday and ends on a Saturday. That's how SAS defines a week to exist. Um, so if we say 14 January 2023 to 15 January 2023, 14 January being on a Saturday, 15 January being on a Sunday, if we say how many weeks have elapsed between those two, 
it will say one week because the week ticked over from day seven to day one. Likewise, if we do something similar with the year interval, if we say what is the year difference between the 31st of December 2023 and the 1st of January 2024, even though that's only one day, SAS will say the year ticked over. And so that's a one year interval difference. And it's just important to keep that in mind when you're working with the in tick function. Um, all of these functions, I think I made slides on, so we'll look at them in more detail. Um, int nx takes a certain interval, for example, day, week, month, year, whatever, a certain starting point, and then you can add a certain increment to it. So you can say, if we look at that middle parameter, which is start from, we can say, okay, from the 1st of January, um, add five weeks. And so your interval would have week in between the quotes. Your start from would be a SAS date of whatever I just said in January, and your increment would be five, five weeks from a certain starting point. Um, we have dat diff. That's the difference in days between one SAS date and the next. The thing just to be careful of there is that actual, actual, uh, I can't remember what they call that. I have it in the slides. It's not alignment. It's something else. Um, but you can basically specify whether you want the actual number of days in a month and the actual number of days in a year. So, Sometimes it's going to be 30, sometimes it's going to be 31, sometimes it's going to be 28 or 29 for February. Do you want SAS to take into account the actual number of days in the months in between these dates and the actual number of days in a year, i.e. 365 or 366 in a, in a leap year? Or do you want it to take into account, and this is for securities and financials, um, do you want SAS to work on a 30 day month and a 360 day year? Because this is how some of the stuff is calculated when you're dealing with securities and financial um, instruments, for example. So if, uh, if you're not working with that, be aware that this is a way uh, of, uh, that SAS can handle it. Similarly, the year diff function, where this gives you the number of days, year diff gives you the number of years, and it does not work in the same way as the intic function. The intic function will give you know if you if you give it thirty first December to the first of January the following year, intic will say that's a whole year that's passed. Year diff will give you a decimal uh, value back. Uh, so that's a more accurate way of, of calculating a difference in between two years. The year diff function similarly also has ways of um, manipulating the number of days or uh, in a month and the number of days in a year. Let's look at these in, in greater detail as well. So for the int tick function, the from and to values can be says dates, times, or day times, but they have to match each other and the interval type. So you cannot have the from value being a date and the to value being a date time. That's going to give you weird results. Um, and of course, you have a certain interval type. So if you if you are dealing with times you're not going to calculate you know how many how many years elapsed between one o'clock and two o'clock on the same day um, so these all have to just match and make sense I don't think SAS will necessarily give you an error I think it might just give you a weird result back um, I already mentioned partial intervals are not counted, so you will not get a decimal value back. Um, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day gives you one full year of difference. 
it does not give you a point uh, whatever one over 365 is um, but year diff the function will give you that decimal value and similarly your week intervals um, count from Sunday to Sunday where Sunday is day one Saturday is day seven so if you tick over from day seven to day one and only one day has passed SAS would technically see that as one week has ticked over uh, there's a couple of valid intervals down at the bottom if you want to write them down or you want to pause the video and play around with it a little bit uh, that's what you would simply put in between the quotes in the function but we'll look at um, we'll look at that when we go to the exercise as well the int nx functions adds multiples of a, a given interval to a date there's again a couple of valid intervals i think it's the same as it is for the intic function um, but int nx which i don't believe was in this uh, i'll scroll back up to the syntax just now i don't believe i put it in the syntax but it has alignment values let me just go up quickly and check okay so the alignment parameter would just go past the increment parameter so comma and then whatever your alignment is by default this alignment is beginning and so the way that works is let's say that we have a SAS date which is the let's say we're in the 17th of March 2023 we can tell SAS to add one month to the 17th of March 2023 and so the default alignment being beginning means that SAS would return the 1st of April. So 17 March, the following month, 1st of April. We can add an alignment value with S in quotes to say that it should add a month and give us the same day back. In which case we would have 17 March become 17 April. If we choose to have the middle alignment value, 17 March will become 15 April when we add a month. If we choose the end alignment, 17 March will become 30th of April. And so that's just a way for you to control certain things. So if somebody says, well, you're currently in January, you get paid on the last day of every month, and you don't know whether it's a leap year or not you can take today's date let's pretend it's the 17th of January now you can say int nx in quotes month because we want to add one month our start date is the 17th of January 2023 the number of, of the multiple we want to add is one because it's one month and then we can add comma in quotes the letter e to find out what the last day of February is. And that's going to give you either the 28th or the 29th, depending on whether it's a leap year or not. Now, when I'm recording this, it's the year 2023. Uh, that's obviously not a leap year. And February has 28 days. But this is a good, um, a very good and very handy function to have if you do not know what your um, what what the last day of a particular month is going to be for example um, you often can see code where people maybe try and, and and work it out so they'll say well okay if i have to impute the last day for february i have to go and check is it going to be the 28th is it going to be the 29th etc that's not a good way of working the int nx function is going to make that a lot easier because of these alignment values moving on the data function i've already mentioned gives you the difference in days between two sas dates um, now just note there i believe this function is applicable only to dates not to date times 
and it accepts a basis argument. Okay, so that's what it's called, basis. And that specifies how difference should be calculated. Now, if you're not in the financial industry, if you're not dealing with financial securities and bonds and treasury bills and whatever it might be, you're not going to worry too much about 30 over 360. 30, 360 being a 30 day month and a 360 day year. Now I'm just going to scroll back up to the syntax. So that's this parameter we're talking about. In quotes, you can specify here 30 slash 360. And the same for your diff as well. Um, what you would use and on a day to day basis would be the actual actual uh, basis argument, which says use the actual number of days and the actual um, uh, number of days in, in a month and the actual number of days in a year between dates. So this is this is written a bit clumsily. But what this is saying is if, for example, you're calculating something from 2020 to 2024 and you're calculating a, the, the difference in days, SAS will go and check when did February have 28 days versus 29 days. When did, uh, so 2020 and 2024, I believe, are the leap years. Um, when did they have 365 days versus 366 days? And that's going to give you a, a, a highly accurate number of um, days in between these two dates. So it's not going to round off or it's not going to just say, oh, well, it's it's 31 and 365. It's It's quite literally going to check for each month and each year, how many days were actually on that calendar. Similarly, the year diff function gives us the difference in years between two SAS dates. Again, please note that it is dates, not date times. Um, if this is applicable to date times as well, I apologize. I believe it's only applicable to dates and you can check chapter 14 in the prep guide just to Make sure that I don't have a, a mistake in my in my slides. Um, and this will give you a decimal value. So it can handle partial uh, partial differences as well, whereas in tick does not. This also accepts a basis argument that specifies how the, the difference should be calculated. This one, instead of supporting only two basis arguments, supports four. Excuse me. So in this case, we have 3360, which is the 30 day month and 360 day year. We have actual actual. We've already talked about that in the data function. We have the actual number of days in the months. And then we divide that by 360 to obtain the number of years. We also have the actual number of days difference divided by 365 to obtain the years. Now that's still going to be pretty accurate, but if you're dealing with a leap year, your year has 366 days, not 365. And that's where this actual actual basis argument is going to give you the most accurate result. But your financials, um, I think the way they calculate, for example, interest on your savings account would be worth this um, basis. So that's the the different um, date functions. Let's move on to the exercise and we'll use a bunch of these in our um, in our exercise as well to see how they work. I'm going to run through the exercise quickly on the slides. But what I've also done is I've made a, a SAS file that has these instructions in comments as well, so that we don't have to keep flipping back and forth between the slides. Now, because this is the first YouTube series I'm doing, I'm learning as I go along, and I wish I had started doing this on all the earlier exercises as well, but I didn't, so sorry. We're going to have a custom employees data set that we're going to look at, um, which I made. Uh, you can just follow along with it or you can try and recreate it um, in, uh, on your own as well and, and try and do the exercise with a, a simulated data set. 
We're going to add a column called today, which contains today's date. We're going to calculate each employee's age as of today when we're running the program. So this could be a sort of, um, imagine this is our payroll program that we're running. Um, we're going to calculate each employee's age. We're going to calculate their years of service. We're going to round it to one decimal. And I've jumped the gun a bit there because we might leave out rounding to one decimal because technically that's part of the numeric functions. Um, and I don't want to get into that at the moment. So I might, I might just scratch out this bit for now. Uh, we're going to calculate the number of days between today and each employee's next birthday. We're going to calculate the next payroll date for each employee. And the way I've set that up is that the employee either gets paid at the start, the middle or the end of a month or a week. And we've got a special bonus for employees who are on the monthly salary frequency to get a bonus in their birthday month. Um, so we're also going to determine which employees are eligible for a bonus uh, at the next payroll. So let's get started with that. And I apologize if you can hear my dog. Um, She can get quite aggressive. Anyway, here's the here's the file that I've set up. We've got um, all of the instructions lined up. I've got the library neatly mapped. So let's let's I'm going to run this whole thing, and it's simply going to load the employees data set into this work.emp data set. And let me move my camera. I'll sit here on the bottom. Okay, this is what our data set looks like. We've got each employee with their name, their sex, their date of birth, when they were hired, what their pay frequency is, either weekly or monthly, and the pay period simply says do they get paid at the end of the week, do they get paid at the end of the month, the middle of the week, the start of the week, and some of this should be middle of the month as well. So that's just a quick way of a quick data set that simulates sort of a payroll or HR um, data set that we that we might see. Um, and so let's get cracking on the code here. And our first instruction was to add a column called today, which contains today's date. So let's simply call the today function, which is this one and put it into a variable called today. And we know that that's simply going to give us a number back, which is not going to be very nice to read. So we're just going to format today as a date nine variable as well. And now if we run this, we have today being the 25th of March, 2023. Now you also know when I record these more or less a week in advance. Um, and we're going to use this column for our next instruction, which was to calculate each employee's age as of today. Now this is a very simple calculation. We could do it with raw values. So we could say, okay, well, age is today's date minus the date of birth column. Again, keep in mind that these are just numbers. So date of birth is still a numeric column, not a character column. It's only got a format on it. So that's the number of days, a certain number of days since 1 January 1960. Today is a certain number of days since 1 January 1960. And because they're from the same epoch, if we subtract one from the other, 
we get the number of days difference. That gives us the age in days of a certain employee. And we can estimate this age by dividing by 365.25 because on average, a year has 365 and a quarter days. We can do this. This gives us a, a quite an accurate a quite an accurate estimation of what the person's age would be. However, we want to be precise. And so we're going to use our year diff function. And we're going to ask year diff for the difference between date of birth and today. And we're going to use this basis argument, actual, actual. And if we run this, we get an age value for each employee. So we can go and check that um, fairly accurately. So if the date of birth was 1983, this is the year 2023. And we have we've got six March and 25 March. So we if we add 40 years to that, we get more or less at the same point, And we can see this is 40.05. So this is our um, this is just a quick desk check to make sure that our calculation works. But we've got a very accurate age um, for all of our employees. Now we don't really need to know that an employee is 44.11 years old. So I will skip ahead a little bit and I will floor this age value. That just means that if it's 41.9, we don't want to round up. If somebody, you know, if it's a day before your birthday, you'll still say, oh, I'm, I'm 30 years old tomorrow. You don't start, you know, if you're, if you're four months from your birthday, you don't start assuming your next age. You always round down. And that's what the floor function gives us. So the floor function is simply going to get rid of the extra decimals that are there. And so we've got age 44, age 40, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And we now have each employee's age calculated. Um, let's calculate the years of service as well for each employee, that's going to be straightforward, it's, it's going to be the same thing, we're simply going to calculate between today, and the hiring date, whereas earlier we did today and the date of birth. Uh, so let's call this variable yos for years of service. That's the year difference uh, between the hiring date, which is called hired and today. And we can use the actual actual again, we can, if we wanted to, we could even just do something a little bit different and use the 30 day uh, month and the 360 day year calculation. Uh, just so we can see how that works. And I'm going to do the same thing here and just floor the years of service. And we've got that here. So for example, this person who started in uh, August 2022 will have zero full years of service because he or she, he, Craig, Craig's only been with us for seven months, if I'm not mistaken, a little less than seven months. So we've got these two calculated, we've got the age of each of our employees, we've got the years of service. Now we get to something a little bit more interesting, which is to calculate the number of days between today and each employee's next birthday. Now let's think about that for a little bit. We want to add a certain number of intervals from one starting point, get a new date, i.e. the new the next birthday date. Let me start over. Let's unpack this step by step. How can we calculate the number of days between today and each employee's next birthday? We first need to understand when the employee's next birthday is occurring. Now that's 
not too complex because we can look at their date of birth, we can look at their age, and we can add one year to their age. And that's the number of intervals of years that we then want to add to their date of birth. Now let's let's start with that. Let's simply say um, the next birthday for each employee, and we're going to use the int nx function for this because we want to add intervals. And we're going to be adding intervals of years. So our interval is specified as year, and you could use single or double quotes, it doesn't matter. We'll talk about when single and double quotes do matter in chapter 17, but that has to do with macros. So we're not going to worry about it too much now. Um, our starting point, because int nx requires a starting point, is going to be the employee's date of birth. And then how many years do we want to add to the date of birth? Well, we have their age today. So if somebody is 44 today, we want to know when they're going to be 45. So if we then say age plus one, that gives us their next birthday. Now there is something wrong with this statement here. And we're going to look at that in our results. And to make it human readable, I'm just going to format it to a human readable date as well. Right. So here's everybody's date of birth. Here's the next birthday. So what has happened in this case? We did not specify an alignment value for int nx. And we also know that if you do not specify an alignment value, int nx will assume the alignment to be the beginning. So when is the beginning of a year? The 1st of January. So because this employee um, was in, in February, we asked when is, uh, or this employee was born February 1979. We asked, when is this employee going to be 45? That's going to be in 2024. But our alignment was the beginning, so we got back to 1st of January. Some of these are 2023 because their birthday has not yet happened. So if your birthday is in August, then we're asking, when are you going to be 32? You're going to be 32 on the 3rd of August, 2023. But that hasn't happened and our alignment is set to the beginning. So that's why we get a 1 January 2023. Now we simply fix this by telling SAS that we want same day alignment. And you can use a capital S or a lowercase s. It does not matter in this case. And now if we rerun this code. We have 12 Feb 1979. Birthday for this year has already happened. Next birthday is 12 Feb 2024. Etc. Etc. So that's all good and well. We've got the next birthday. However, the um, question asked us for the number of days until the next birthday. So we have to go and calculate that. Um, we could use probably either the intic function, or we could use the dat function. The intic function is going to give us whole days back. Whereas the dat function, I think, no, it won't give us partial days because it only accepts SAS dates. Well, we can do we can do both. Um, so let's say next be there for days, and let's say this is our intic function. 
and we'll compare the results just to to see what the difference is and i might not have the exact answer if they do differ but i think they should be the same so the difference in days between today and the next birthday and these are both sas dates that was the whole point of doing this calculation and then let's do next b day that diff and it should be as simple as um no sorry that's gonna be next but they today and we'll use the actual actual difference okay let's run this and see what we get hopefully i don't have a syntax error somewhere um oh i need to swap them so i've just swapped the 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 order is wrong which is why the one is positive and the one is negative but so far it looks to me like all these guys match anyway so in this case we could have used either one of these um either one of these functions yeah there we go it's um that's the same regardless of which function you use which is what i expected at the end of the day so i'm gonna ah, it, it can be either one i'm gonna leave both there it doesn't really matter um that's the number of days between today and each employee's next birthday our next instruction is to calculate the next payroll date for each employee and the way we're going to do this is we're going to look at um, today's date and we're going to determine do they get paid weekly or monthly and do they get paid at the start, the middle or the end of the week. Um, so if today is the 25th of March and this person gets paid at the end of the month, we're simply going to say, well, you know, When's your, when's your next payroll? So that's probably going to give us the end of April instead of the end of March. It's just a, it might not be completely accurate. It's just a way of illustrating when the, um, how, how the, the alignment functions work as well for the, for the int NX function. So we've got a couple of things to keep in mind here. The first being that this pay period gives us the um, alignment value. So start should be the B alignment value, M is the M alignment value, and end is the E alignment values, because we've got beginning, middle, and end for the alignment values. Um, and instead of having to rewrite, so in, we, we could say, well, if it's weekly and it, the pay period is start and then if it's weekly and the pay period is middle and if it's weekly and the pay period is end but then we're repeating ourselves a bunch of times so what we would rather do is we would take this pay period uh, start middle and end and we would rewrite that to b and m and e and then we could refer to a variable when we're doing that um, so we can say if pay period is start then our alignment value is b else if pay period equals middle then our alignment value is m and likewise if pay period is end then alignment value is e because that's what the int nx function understands for um, alignment values. The other thing we have is S, which is same day, but payrolls usually don't work like that. They get paid at the beginning, the middle, or the end of a, a particular month. Um, and now that's going to be our alignment variable that we're going to use in the int nx function. Notice that I don't simply put an else here at the end, because if something does not say start, middle, and end, I don't want it to simply fall through and say okay alignment is end so i would rather have it be missing and then i would notice that something is missing and i'd go and fix that which it shouldn't be in this case 
So there's all of our alignments, beginning, middle, and end. And that corresponds to start, middle, and end here. Then we need to determine between the weekly and the monthly pay frequency what um, um, interval we're going to use. So in this case, I'm, I could use the same logic that I used here, which is to put it into a different variable. Um, I might just here use an if statement and say, well, if pay frick equals weekly, then do something. Likewise, else if pay frick equals monthly, then do something. And we're going to put our logic in between these two do blocks. Um, for the weekly one, we can say our next pay date is, and once again, I'm going to use the int index function because we want to add a certain interval to an existing date. We're going to add a week to today's date. We want to add one week and we're going to use this alignment variable that we did before. If we didn't do this, we would have to say, okay, if pay frequency is weekly, and then we would say in here, if start, then use B, if middle, then make this an M, if end, then make this an E. And we would have to go and repeat that below for the monthly, the monthly period as well. So this is a way of avoiding a lot of redundant code. And as I've said, you could do the same here because pay freq weekly and pay freq monthly, we are also rewriting code where we could have put that into um, uh, an interval variable. And instead of specifying week for weekly, we could have mapped it to a variable and we could have executed the int index command once instead of twice um, and avoided that redundancy. But that is spilt milk under the bridge. And we're not going to worry about that too much now. I'm the one doing the typing anyway, so don't uh, don't worry about it. Um, we want to add one month to today, so that's why our interval value here is one. Um, and we're going to use the same alignment. So is it the start, the middle, or the end of the month? And just to make it human readable, we're going to add a format onto this next pay date. Okay, so if um, today's the 25th of March and you get paid the beginning of next month, that's going to be the 1st of April, 1st of April. This is a bit of a mistake because we don't want to, uh, we would ideally want to see this person get paid on the 31st of March. And so what you could do here is you could probably add... Um, you could probably make two variables and I'm just spitballing just off the top of my head. You could have one where you could find the end, the middle and the start of the current month. Um, and you could say that if the, the, the one in the current month is still upcoming, use that one if it's already passed use the next one where you've added one so you could probably do something with like a zero and a one um let me check this quickly if i make this a zero what do i get so for this person so that'll give you the 31st of march um So you would then have to go and check. You would have to go and check between these two dates, which one is still still upcoming. Um, because that will give you other issues. So if you've got monthly and start, then 25 March becomes the 1st of March. So you would have to, for this for this monthly one, you'd have to go and check between zero and one, if you add zero, zero months and one month with a particular alignment, which one is the in the past or which one is the first upcoming one. 
so I'll leave that as as homework um, the logic is already there you would basically just need to filter between the two the two options if there's a better way of doing it as I said I'm just spitballing you're welcome to drop a note in the comments and let me know your your logic as well um, and then to finish off the last instruction is very easy employees on the monthly salary plan get a bonus in their birthday month uh, determine which employees are eligible for a bonus. That's very simple. So we extract the month. We say, okay, well, if the month of the next pay date is the same month as the month of their date of birth. And notice here that we are not looking at year or day or anything else. We're simply saying, if you're on the monthly pay schedule and you were born in February and the next pay date is in February month, two equals month two then you get a bonus and it's as simple as that and if we look at this we can see we've got two employees only two employees eligible for a bonus their next pay dates are in april and they were both born in april april 1964 april 1973 that simple That is, I believe, it for the exercise. Um, I'm going to hop back to the slides and just make sure we did do everything we did. Um, and that wraps it up for today. So next time, what we're going to look at is going to be the string and character functions. There's a, a whole bunch of them. Something that I want to spend a bit of time on is especially the compress function because it's, it's so useful and it's so easy to, to misunderstand and not, not be fully aware of how it works. Um, 14C, I think, is going to be a short episode. It's got a couple of numeric functions like uh, flooring, um, ceiling, rounding, truncating, all that sort of stuff. Um, probably throw in like a modulo function or something in there as well. Um, but that's going to be a shorter one. Uh, this was a long one and the string and character functions episode will also be on the longer side. You do have to be aware of all these functions and how they work. So go and play around with it. Go and, um, you know, spend a little bit of time on it. Make your own mock data sets and, and really get to grips with these functions so that when you see them in the exam, you know what to look out for and you know how they they work instinctively the other thing that i want to mention is once we're done with episode 14 we really are nearing the end we've only got up to episode or chapter 17 to go inclusive um, so we're getting there we should be able to wrap up in a couple of weeks and then we've covered almost everything that the SAS based prep guide has to to offer uh, there's one or two extra things we need to look at that are applicable for the exam but not in the prep guide at least not in the edition that i have it might have changed in the meantime um, but we'll, we'll we'll cover that in the meantime we're at, we're at episode 14 we're only going up to 17 so we're making great progress that's it for today Thank you very much as always for watching. Thanks for putting up with all of my waffling and rambling. Leave a comment if I've made any mistakes. If you've got a different way of solving something, let me know. And um, yeah, that's it. You're welcome to like and subscribe as well. Thank you very much for watching. Cheers. See you for the next one. Bye-bye.